So it's finally time to start talking about Guardians of the Galaxy, which has been hyped to hell and back, hasn't it? I mean, these trailers have been playing for months, it seems, and it's been getting amazing reviews from so many people, and turns out for very good reason. I really, really like this one. This is definitely one of the best movies I have seen all year, and... You know, I might even go so far as to say this is probably my number two Marvel film right behind the Avengers. It it really is that good. It's loaded with plenty of action and great characters and the comedy is outstanding and just it's a very, very fun movie. Uh, now, before I go into any details here, just so we're all on the same page, Guardians of the Galaxy is a Marvel property that I'm not terribly familiar with. So I went into this movie knowing a little bit about the characters from just what bits and pieces I read on Wikipedia, but I don't know a whole lot about the comics that they're based on. So I can't really comment on how faithful this is to the source material. I can only judge it as a movie. If you are familiar with the comics and you have seen Guardians of the Galaxy and you would like to comment on how faithful this is to the source material, and what you thought of it as an adaptation, by all means, sound off in the comments. I'd love to hear from you, but I can only judge it as a movie. As a movie, it's fucking awesome. I can tell you that right now. The story begins with a very young Peter Quill who actually witnesses his mother die from cancer. Uh, despite being mostly a comedy, this actually starts off on a pretty sad note, and immediately after his mother dies, just to add insult to injury, he gets abducted by aliens. You know, as you do. And then the movie fast forwards about 26 years, and the adult Peter Quill, who now calls himself Star-Lord, the legendary outlaw... Legendary according to who? According to him, clearly. And he is searching this abandoned planet for an ancient artifact that he and this group of thieves that he runs with has found a buyer for. And as he's walking through this cave looking for the artifact, he pulls out his Walkman and puts on some 70s pop music and starts dancing his way through the cave. Now keep in mind this is right after we just saw his mother bite the bullet from the cancer. And we go straight from that to come and get your love. Just a bit jarring, maybe. Um, <laughs> just, just a little. I, and and I. It's not that I didn't like that scene. I do. I think it's a very powerful scene. But maybe put it in the middle of the movie as a flashback might have been a bit better. And I know twenty six years had passed for the character, so you know, for the character, it's not jarring. But for the audience, where only about ninety seconds had passed, was a little weird. But. Anyway, he finds the artifact and decides, you know what, I don't want to work for these thieves anymore. I'm going to go into business for myself. So he leaves the planet to go sell it on his own. This does not make Yondu, his former employer, very happy, so he puts out a bounty on him, which is picked up by Rocket Raccoon and his muscle-slash-houseplant Groot. Elsewhere, the evil Ronin is also looking for this artifact, as it apparently contains a very powerful weapon that he intends to use to conquer the universe, like any good comic book villain. And so he sends his assassin Gamora to go after Star-Lord and take the artifact from him. And all four of these people collide on the planet and cause a huge mess with their fighting, and they're all arrested and thrown in the slammer, where they meet the fifth member of this ragtag group of adventurers, Drax the Destroyer. They eventually find a way to escape from this prison in a very funny sequence that involves a prosthetic leg. I will say no more, <laughs> but uh, that, oh god, that scene just, I, I just about died. If, when you see it, you'll know what I'm talking about. Holy shit, that was funny. Um, they escape from the prison and Eventually, they all come to realize just how dangerous a weapon this is, and there is no way that they can ever let Ronan get his hands on this, because it will almost certainly mean the end of the known universe. And so, they, the rest of the movie is basically them trying to put a stop to Ronan and his universe-conquering ways. So overall, this film was 
very, very funny. It is definitely just as much a comedy as it is an action-adventure film, although it does have a few genuinely depressing moments in there. Um, I mentioned the scene right at the beginning, and I'm not going to go into detail about any more scenes to avoid spoilers, but there are some genuinely sad moments in this movie, uh, especially from things that on paper might not sound all that sad, you know, given the characters involved, but they work very well. As far as the characters go, the Guardians themselves are a lot of fun. First, we have Peter Quill, aka Star-Lord, played by Chris Pratt, who is basically the thief with the heart of gold. He's not afraid to bend the rules a bit as long as there's a profit involved, but still, he'll stand up for a cause as long as it's the right one. And Chris Pratt plays that character very well. He was a lot of fun to watch. And then we have the deadly but beautiful assassin Gamora, and those are always the best kind of assassins, aren't they? Uh, played by Zoe Saldana, who is a daughter of Thanos, the evil titan, an adopted daughter, I should say, and she is more or less the straight man of the group. Straight man, straight woman, straight person, straight extraterrestrial being, you know what I mean. She's the serious character. <laughs> um, and we have Drax the Destroyer, who is played by Dave Batista of WWE fame. And he is the muscle of the group, and also apparently comes from a planet where metaphors don't exist, so he takes everything literally. Metaphors go right over his head, but don't tell him that, because he'll respond with, nothing goes over my head. I have... Great reflexes. Something along those lines. Uh, and he is uh, after Ronan in this movie because Ronan, I guess, killed his family many years ago and he's out for revenge. I was a little bit worried when I found out Dave Batista, of all people, was cast as Drax because my only exposure to Batista has been through WWE. And, you know... Watching him in WWE, I never really thought he was a bad actor, at least when he was playing his wrestling character, but nothing about him really stood out either, so I wasn't really sure what was going to happen here. You know what? This role was perfect for him. Absolutely perfect. He, he was made to play Drax the Destroyer. This was a very good performance from him. I was genuinely surprised. A, a welcome surprise, to be sure. So then we have Rocket Raccoon, who is easily the star of this movie. He is a bounty hunter, and he is sarcastic, and a major asshole, and a loudmouthed asshole, and also loves his big guns. Well, tends to wield guns that are about as large as he is. This guy is 10 tons of fun in a 10-pound ball of fur. I love him. And Bradley Cooper was clearly having way too much fun <laughs> voicing this character, and I cannot say I blame him. This, I love this character so much, and it's, it's worth seeing just for Rocket Raccoon alone. And then finally we have Rocket's houseplant slash muscle Groot, who is voiced by Vin Diesel. And Groot is a very simple-minded character, I guess you could say, uh, almost childlike in a way. Uh, but certainly can hold his own in a fight. He is huge and freakishly strong. Also, he is a man, creature, extraterrestrial being. He, he is a creature of few words. Uh, it, he's kind of similar to Hodor in a way, B big and simple-minded and doesn't talk much, although while Hodor only has one word in his vocabulary, Groot has actually managed three. I, Am, and Groot. Specifically in that order. And that's pretty much the only line he has in this movie. Now, this is something I've harped on before. I don't know why they chose Vin Diesel to play this character when, really, if I didn't know going into this movie that it was Vin Diesel, I never would have known because the voice has been modified to hell and really anyone could have played this character. I'm sure the only reason they chose Vin Diesel is so they could have another big name on the marquee which is a trend with any film that features animated characters nowadays, really, that they just don't want to hire voice actors for some reason. They want to have the big name. It's like Neil Patrick Harris in Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs. 
you never would have known it was him unless you saw his name in the credits. That being said, Vin Diesel does a stellar job as Groot. I really liked this performance, which is remarkable considering he only says three words. Now, he says them multiple times, and for some reason, every time he says them, Rocket always knows what he's actually trying to say, which makes no goddamn sense. It's, it's kind of like Han Solo and Chewie in a way. But, but yeah, I, how he can interpret this, I don't know, but fuck it, it's hilarious, we'll let it go. But yeah, just the personality of this character is so likable, and yet they do all this with virtually no dialogue at all, except for those three words, I am Groot, just over and over again. And I mean, it's partly in the animation, because he's a completely CGI character, but the voice definitely helps. If it, you know, if it wasn't for that, this character wouldn't work. And it's amazing, considering how many movies I have talked about before, where you have these characters that have no personality at all, no matter how many lines of dialogue you give them, uh, Bella Swan, Wanderer, Edward Cullen, the entire goddamn cast of The Last Airbender. And yet here is this guy who says almost nothing and has more personality than all of those characters combined, which just makes me wonder, how can it really be this difficult to give a character some personality? How? <laughs> oh, but, but there it is. Now, as far as the other characters, we have Yondu, Star-Lord's former employer, I guess I should say, who is played by uh, Michael Rooker from Walking Dead fame. And really, he's basically playing Merle in this movie, just a blue-skinned and somewhat less racist version of Merle. But, you know, it's always fun to see Michael Rooker, even if he really is just playing himself. And I really did like his weapon of choice. Um, I'm told that in the comics he was an archer, but in this movie he just has a single arrow that he controls by whistling. Which is creative, if nothing else. Um, that, it, that was actually kind of fun to watch, just to, especially when he finally busts it out and just starts chopping people down with this magical arrow powered by whistling. <laughs> Such a bizarre concept, and maybe this is just me, but when he finally did bust this arrow out and start killing people with it, I half expected him to start whistling a well-known song. Like, for some reason, the first thing that came to my mind was Winds of Change. I don't know why... That's, that's just the way my brain works, and if they did that, it would have made no goddamn sense, even though it would have been funny, but anyway, I, yeah, I did like Michael Rooker in this. Uh, Benicio Del Toro has a small part in this movie as well as the Collector, which is a, a guy that they try to initially sell the, uh, the orb to after they bust out of prison, and he, at as the name implies, is a collector of basically anything. He's got uh, tons of living artifacts in his little museum. Uh, there's a, a Dark Elf from Thor the Dark World. There's uh, one of the Jatari from the Avengers. Uh, there's something else that I don't want to mention, just in case this movie... Just in case any of you haven't seen this movie yet. It was a, definitely a weird surprise to see this, this thing in the movie. That's all I will say. And then we come to the villains, who honestly are probably the weak links in this movie. Not that they're necessarily bad characters, it's just that compared to the Guardians, they are grossly overshadowed. Which, which is probably more just because the Guardians are so well done that there's just not, no way the villains can compete. But anyway, Ronan, the big bad for this movie, Feels like a very stock comic book villain, you know, that your general wants to take over the world type. Not a whole lot more motivation to him, really, and I kind of wish they had done a bit more with him. Uh, I can't really blame the actor. He's played by Lee Pace, who did a very good job with the character, given what he had to work with. And I am glad that they didn't try to make him a more comic villain, and they actually give a, a serious threat to the Guardians to kind of balance out their silliness. I, I think that was the right call. Just wish he was a bit more fleshed out. Um, his second-in-command, Nebula, played by a hairless Karen Gillan, which was really weird when she revealed that at uh, Comic-Con 
panel not too long ago. <laughs> she actually shaved her head for this role. Uh, she is a bit more fleshed out. She at least has some more motivation to her character as she's a uh, an adopted daughter of Thanos, who is currently on loan to Ronan to help him do some of his dirty work, and she's interested in avenging her family, uh, much like Drax the Destroyer, actually. And then there is Thanos himself, who only makes a brief appearance in this movie. Uh, it's the second time he's appeared in a Marvel film. He was actually teased at the end of The Avengers. I don't know if they ever actually intended to make him part of The Avengers movies, or if that was just thrown in there because they wanted to use him at some point in the future. But, of course, the, the villain in the second Avengers movie is going to be Ultron, so... But yeah, and he only shows up for a moment. When he does, he's, it works well. He's played by an uncredited Josh Brolin, I believe. Um, but yeah, it works well enough for his brief appearance. Uh, quite a few cameos in this one. Of course, there's the obligatory Stan Lee cameo. There's was also a cameo from Lloyd Kaufman, of all people. I was kind of surprised to see that. Although, uh, based on what I read afterwards, I guess I really shouldn't have been, because the uh, director and co-writer, James Gunn, I guess got his start working for Kaufman's trauma films, so he gave his old boss a cameo, which was nice of him. Uh, I'm told Nathan Fillion has a cameo in this movie. I must have blinked at the wrong time, because I didn't catch it. Uh, also, Rob Zombie, at least his voice, is in this movie somewhere as well, as, a uh, the navigator on one of, on a Yondu ship, I believe, which was odd. If, if I didn't see his name in the credits, I wouldn't have known he was there, but he's in there for whatever that's worth. Uh, so that's really all I can say about the characters in this film. Uh, the visuals are very well done. Uh, there's a a lot of CG in this movie, but fortunately it's very good CG, especially Rocket and Groot, and just the sheer amount of detail that went into those characters. Very well done. Uh, I did see this in 3D. Um, I was told this was a post-conversion. Wouldn't have known that going into this. The 3D is extremely well done. I really like that. Uh, I, I've seen some Marvel movies before that were post-converted to 3D, and there were several times when I'm sitting there watching this and thinking, I'm watching a 2D image that's just slightly been converted to 3D. That This one, they, they actually did a good job with the 3D. There, uh, the soundtrack, as long as you like 70s pop music, you will love this soundtrack, because that's pretty much all it is. And... Oddly enough, the soundtrack itself actually has a connection to the story. I mentioned earlier that uh, Star-Lord has a, an old Walkman that he takes with him and listens to some good old 70s pop music on his journeys. There is actually a reason for that in the story, because his mother, I guess, liked to make him mixtapes of some of the music that she grew up with, and he carries around a tape that his mom made for him, and that's what he uses to remember her. And that was actually kind of clever, I thought, to, you know, take the soundtrack and actually make it part of the movie. That's not something you see very often. I mean, outside of a musical, of course. Uh, and really, I guess the only other thing I can talk about is the post credit scene, because of course there's a post credit scene. I'm not going to tell you what happens. I am simply going to say... What? I'm not really sure. This could go one of two ways. Either this was just a moment where they wanted to make the audience go, what? And if so, mission accomplished. Or maybe this is hinting at possibly a reboot of a certain character somewhere down the line. Don't know. I guess time will tell, but, uh, yeah, that, that was, um, that was interesting. And that's all I have to say about Guardians of the Galaxy. I would definitely say this is worth seeing at full price. It is worth seeing at the, and that's all I have to say about Guardians of the Galaxy. If you have not seen it yet, go.
it is worth seeing. It is worth seeing at full price. It is worth seeing with the 3D surcharge. It is just worth seeing. Just fucking go. Go and see this movie. You will laugh your ass off. I promise. Go. Go see it. And take care. And remember, we are Groot. You'll understand that after you see the movie. So go.